Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. This is Venable's presentation on the future of the CFPB post appeals court decision. Today is October 28th, 2022, and I am Jonathan Pompan, also joined by several of my partners who we'll introduce in just a moment. But first, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first off, of course, this session will be recorded. Um, and for those of you that are watching on the recording and even those that are watching live, please understand that this is a snapshot in time. It's a highly evolving area of the law uh, and obviously litigation um, that is now happening in multiple jurisdictions across the country. So um, please re reflect, note that this session today is um, the best information that we have as of now. But of course, if you're watching this later in time, um, there probably will have certainly been many events that will have transpired since. Of course, also today's session is not legal advice either. So every company and person and individual situation is different. Please seek out your legal counsel for advice. And we know that there are many people on that are lawyers, as well as also many that are compliance staff. Um, certainly um, coordinate as appropriate too uh, within your own organizations. Now, today's presentation is also for CLE. We will pause um, ha about halfway through to provide a CLE code for those that are attending live. We have a record of who you are, and we will also be sending that information to you after first the uh, CLE um, credentials. We'll also be providing that code at the end too, so please stay tuned. We will also have a Q&A session um, towards the end. Uh, we'll try to work in your questions too throughout. So please feel free to send questions using the uh, features in the Zoom portal, and we'll be happy to try to incorporate those as appropriate. Of course, some of those we might get to um, in any event and, and know that. So uh, if you don't hear your uh, question or a response to your question immediately, uh, please know that we are looking and we'll try to do so. Now, also, today's session is one that's going to cover a lot of different topics. You know, first off, there is a um, court decision that you probably have heard of because it's been over a week. And uh, the Fifth Circuit uh, declared the CFPB funding mechanism unconstitutional. It's made headlines across the country in the press, trade press, and probably just about every law firm, too. And then we're also going to cover the background, too, that has transpired. Um, how did we get here? What's the impact also, particularly on the payday lending rule or small dollar uh, loan rule that uh, the Fifth Circuit case was about? And also, what does it mean for CFPB actions in general? That's not just enforcement matters or examination matters, uh, but also the rule makings, the bully pulpit usage that the Bureau has partaken in over the last 10 years, and so much more. And then uh, we're going to take a deep dive in particular on CFPB investigations and active litigation, and then talk about what's next. Where's this going? How might this resolve itself? Um, and in the meantime, how disruptive will it possibly be? So without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Terrific group of folks, folks I've worked with for a very long time, uh, starting with Ellen Burge. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Ellen Burge. I'm here in the Washington, D.C. office of Venable. I co-chair the Financial Services Group. I'm also uh, a member of the Advertising Law Group, and I'm happy to be part of this panel today. Len? Good morning, everybody. I'm Len Gordon. I uh, lead the advertising and marketing practice at Venable. I also work with the financial services practice. I actively litigate against the CFPB frequently, and I'm delighted to be talking to you all today. Mike? Hey, everybody. I'm Mike Resnick. Uh, I'm a former financial fraud prosecutor at the Department of Justice, and I currently head the, uh, the firm's financial services investigations and enforcement practice, um, handling matters with DOJ, CFPB, SEC, and, and many others. Uh, Josh? Hi, it's Josh Raymond. Um, I lead the government affairs and legislative practice here at uh, Glad to be with all you this morning. And I'm Jonathan Pompan, chair of our Consumer Financial Services Group. And together, we all have varied experiences involving the CFPB, go ranging all the way from investigations and enforcement to the rulemaking and policy initiatives and counseling on day-to-day -day consumer financial law. And to start off, though, we thought it would be important to bring everybody up to speed. Now, many of you probably have read many articles about this already, 
But what exactly happened here? What is this about? What is the Fifth Circuit decision? And where did it come from? Well, to start, first off, there are a couple important things to note. The headlines. Next stages in CFPB's uncertain future, you may have read. Winning the battle, but losing the war. Fifth Circuit ruling chills consumer financial protections. Fifth Circuit small dollar rule decision throws CFPB future into question. Um, if you didn't know better, you'd say it was an existential threat to the CFPB, but as you'll hear in a bit, the CFPB actually doesn't quite think so. But we're gonna unpack all of that and first talk about what the Fifth Circuit decision is. So how did we get here? Well, Community Financial Services Association and the Consumer Service Alliance of Texas um, had filed a lawsuit contesting the validity of the small dollar lending rule that the CFPB put out in 2017. But in fact, actually the story starts a lot earlier than that. It goes back all the way to the passage of Dodd-Frank. Now, the Consumer Financial Protection Act, as many know, and you know, these are slides that we could pull out from 10 years ago, um, was uh, a unique agency, at least uh, as it is compared to many others. Um, it stripped the rulemaking authority and the uh, enforcement capabilities uh, and oversight for various consumer financial laws and brought it all into the CFPB that would then be formed. The CFPB does have and does share uh, enforcement authority and in some cases certain uh, other authorities with other government agencies, including in some cases the Federal Trade Commission. And of course, state AGs have the ability to enforce uh, aspects of the Consumer Financial Protection Act. But uh, for all intents and purposes, the CFPB was not only the new sheriff in town, but it was also intentionally set up to be uh, the Uber agency for consumer financial services and consumer protection. Now, its structure, though, um, was, while intentional, uh, was a bit unique. And in particular, um, there's an independent structure that it was set up under the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, of course, as many have heard over the years, and as we've certainly given many presentations on, the CFPB also has a five-year term for a single director nominated by the president and approved by the Senate. Now, that issue in particular was litigated in the seal of law decision, which eventually, as decided, means that the director can be removed for or without cause. In other words, at the president's discretion. So that's one area of insulation that's already been removed from the Consumer Financial Protection Act and the CFPB structure. But with respect to funding, the CFPB is intentionally set up by Congress to be an independent agency within the Federal Reserve Board structure and also receives its funding from the Federal Reserve Board. Now, the funding mechanism is what's a challenge here in this case, in the Fifth Circuit case. And the funding of the CFPB was intentionally done to insulate. Now, in the case of the uh, Plaintiffs in the Fifth Circuit, it, they call it double insulation. Um, but the funding from the Federal Reserve is capped at a preset percentage based on uh, a, a annual scale. Um, and according though to the CFPB and Dodd-Frank's supporters, it was a long established process. CFPB was not unique. It was one that was outside the congressional appropriations process, but intentionally so, because Congress over the years had consistently provided for independent funding for various bank supervisors for long-term planning, the execution of complex initiatives, and safety and soundness and compliance with the law. And much like other banking agencies on the federal level, CFPB's funding mechanism was not viewed as unique by its supporters. That being said, it does not receive or go through the annual congressional appropriations process in any way. And so as a result, that issue is something that later comes up in 2017 and forward in the Fifth Circuit decision. Jonathan, can, we, um, can you talk a little bit here or, or any of our panelists really about what, what is really different um, 
why why is the CEFPB as an unappropriated agency different from others potentially? Is it that double double insulation or is it other aspects? Um, I've read, for example, that um, you know any extra money the CFPB has at the end of the year doesn't revert to Treasury, like perhaps with other agencies. But some of these differences, I think, might be critical to setting up what the Fifth Circuit uh, thought through. I I can try and answer that, Ellen, and and then I think you know talking about the decision will we'll build on that. The CFPB's funding mechanism mechanism is a little bit unique. They essentially submit a budget, they send it to the uh, the Fed, and, and they are funded. Um, those funds, if they weren't requisitioned by the CFTB, would in fact uh, be reverted by the Fed to the general uh, FISC, the general public FISC, and, and would be subject to appropriation by Congress. So th that, that is somewhat unique. And the other thing that makes this unique, and it's a focus of the court's opinion, is the incredibly broad and aggressive enforcement authorities that were given to the agency. And you, you see that almost daily now as uh, Director Chopra seeks to increase continually and very aggressively the, the scope of the CFPB's jurisdiction and the uh, things that he's seeking to change. He, he's seeking to make the CFPB a uh, antitrust agency and going after companies that control large amounts of data. He's seeking to make the CFPB an anti-discrimination agency uh, by using the agency's own fairness authority. And I think those concerns fed into the Fifth Circuit's opinion. Uh, the Fifth Circuit's opinion begins with some really colorful language. You know, I'm gonna quote here, this is the, really the, the very beginning of the opinion. An elective death Despotism was not the government we fought for, but one which we should not only be founded on free principles, but in which the powers of government should be so divided and balanced as that no one could transcend their legal limits without being effectively checked and restrained by the other. In particular, as George Mason put it in 1787, the purse and the sword should never get into the same hands. And that, that concern is what underlies the, the court's opinion that because the director gets to sort of like submit his own budget and then gets to enforce the laws without any supervision by Congress, it violates the separation of powers. So we should get into the decision a little bit more. I'm not, um, Jonathan, is this back to you on how we get to this, this case? Or, or, sure. Or Mike or and you know, this case um, importantly uh, revolved around the payday lending rule, which was finalized in 2017. And that rule was contentious. Um, and I think, you know, to Len's point, um, the aggressive nature of the Bureau, um, it has done rulemaking as it's certainly done many other policy uh, initiatives and uh, sort of ghost rulemakings uh, through enforcement. Um, but this was one that was uh, out front in public, uh, rulemaking on uh, payday lending uh, and certain other small dollar loans. Um, and CFSA sued to invalidate the payday lending rule. Um, they made numerous arguments regarding the validity of the rule, um, including obviously this constitutional argument that we've talked about, but also that the rule itself was arbitrary and capricious and on many different grounds uh, exceeded uh, the scope of the CFPB's authority with respect to the actual conduct that it was regulating. Um, ultimately, and as we'll see, um, the court did not agree with any of those other arguments. It, this decision really focuses exclusively on uh, the uh, constitutionality of the funding mechanism. And then, of course, the implications of that, though, are, are huge. Um, on the specifics, on the substantive matter of the rule itself, the court actually was okay with it. So, um, it, it's, uh, you know, win some, lose some, it just turns out the one that this Bureau lost on is the big one. Um, the panel held that the CFPB, uh, as funded, is an unconstitutional uh, mechanism and structure. The court reasoned that the framers sought to create separation of powers and put the power of the purse, uh, uh, Article 9, Section 8, uh, uh, from the Constitution in the hands of Congress. And that appropriations clause um, is paramount. Now, that being said, we've already heard previously that the CFPB didn't agree with that. Of course, they briefed the opposite arguments. And since then, um, in the last week, 
have been um, echoing similar uh, statements. They, CFPB believes the court found, uh, found this wrong. Um, this was a three-person panel on ultimately a uh, much larger appellate court. How this will unfold, of course, is the, the big question. Now, the appropriations clause itself, um, of course, um, provides the ultimate check uh, for Congress. And in this case, the court found that extremely compelling. Um, it, it, you know, it said by abandoning its most complete and effectual check on the overgrown prerogatives of the other branches of government, indeed by enabling them, in the Bureau's case, Congress ran afoul of the separation of powers embodied in the appropriations clause. Um, and I think importantly, again, the backdrop here was a rulemaking that went through notice and comment. Um, this was not even substantively about, um, you know, an insertion in the examination manual for um, uh, UDAP or any other areas where industry and those in the uh, consumer financial services practice have taken issue with the lack of clarity and some of the arbitrary nature of what Director Chopra and others at the Bureau have done over the years. This was something that was uh, flat out um, in public, transparent rulemaking uh, with notice and comment that then still led to this ultimate decision. Now, um, in invalidating the, the rule, uh, the CFPB um, is now faced with uh, a sort of existential threat. We'll be talking about that in a moment. But I think it's important to consider um, ultimately um, that this is not the only case that's pending out there too. There are others. And so we'll talk about those as well. Um, let me let, uh, um, insert a question here, actually. Um, we've heard a lot about, there's been a lot of focus on funding, but certainly at what extent do you think maybe concepts of accountability have come into play here as well? And did the but, court yeah. look into I, th that? Th th those go directly together. I mean, you know, at least according to the founding fathers, the reason Congress holds power of the purse is to control how those monies are spent and to be able to call the other branches of government to account, in particular the executive, for, for things that it's doing. So, you know, we're all familiar with congressional oversight hearings. Certainly that's one way. But, you know, for, I can tell you from my time at the FTC, the agency was always very nervous uh, that it would get called on the carpet for uh, in its budget hearings about the way it was spending money. Was it maximizing value for taxpayers and uh, pr prioritizing the right things? Was it um, being unduly harsh on business? Was it not doing enough to protect consumers? The CFPB is insulated from all of that. And that, you know, as Jonathan said, that was not an accident. The, the idea was to create a, an agency that was sort of free of political pressures and that makes sense, I think, when you're talking about the, the banking agencies, the prudential banking regulators, you want that sort of objectiveness. You don't want uh, banking regulators making safety and soundness discussions perhaps to be influenced by politics. But given the, the portfolio that was given to the CFPB and given the uh, incredibly broad range of powers that it's got, you know, it's, it's got rulemaking authority, it's got, it can obtain civil penalties, it can obtain redress, it can do a lot of that in its own administrative proceedings. It, it really has a, uh, there's no other agency in, in government that has the powers that it has. And there's no other agency in government that is funded in quite the way that it has. As, as you mentioned earlier, Ellen, the, the even the Fed, um, reverts funds at the end of the year, if it's not spent or above a certain percentage, back to the treasury, back to the public fist. The CFPB is really unique in that it gets to keep any sort of leftover money at the end of the year, which is, is, is truly unique. So I think you know the, the unique uh, amalgam of powers and while the CFPB's funding mechanism is similar to other agencies, it truly is unique. I think it's that combination that the Fifth Circuit ultimately found violated the separation of powers principles and the funding clause, the appropriations clause. I think it's worth adding, I, you know, Jonathan said that, uh, you know, you win some, you lose some. And in this case, CFPB lost the big one. I, mean, I think that's an understatement. I mean, this, if you're, you know, Avengers fan, this is the equivalent of, you know, Tony Stark getting the Infinity Stones and just destroying Thanos. I mean, you can't do anything without funding. 
you can't you can't do exams, you can't do rulemaking, you can't issue CIDs. This this is everything to the CFPB. Well, we can talk more about that, but does this decision alone though mean that the CFPB will get no more money in the future? I mean, this is just one circuit, so it's this um, it, it is not the end, but it you know, we're on a path towards the beginning of the end. I mean, depending on where you know, the court cases go. I mean, I can't predict necessarily how the Supreme Court will ultimately rule on it. I think that's likely where it's headed. You have the Fifth Circuit ruling that we've been talking about. I think it's very clear that there's going to be, you know, other circuits weighing in on it. You're going to have a circuit split at some point, and ultimately it's going to go to the court. Um, you know, we'll see how they rule. But, you know, if, if they rule consistent with the Fifth Circuit, you know, I, I, I can't see a future for the CFPB. Yeah, it's interesting the way the, the Fifth Circuit um, phrase its ruling here. It didn't just sort of say that the CFPB is unconstitutional in all aspects and sh should be immediately shut down. It was a little more circumspect, um, perhaps to try and you know defend it, its opinion as it as it makes its way up up the road to the S Supreme Court. It said that the you know the, the plaintiff in that case was required to show that the unconstitutional funding mechanism hurt them. So, you know, to invalidate the rule that the plaintiffs in this case, CFSA, had to show that the unconstitutional funding mechanism hurt them, the court found that in this case, that was relatively straightforward because absent the funding, you know, the, the funding allowed the rule to be promulgated. So on, on that basis, it um, invalidated the rule. And it, as Mike said, it's hard to imagine what else... Um, could survive because everything the Bureau does stems from this funding. I mean, the, the cleaning staff uh, stems from this funding, um, but it, it does seem to invite a sort of an action by action, uh, whether it's rule by rule, case by case, CID by CID, examination by examination type of um, you know, litigation and, and process at least until the, you know, the issue is resolved. And I think, you know, one of the things we'll, we'll talk about a bit is, you know, when's the litigation going to be resolved? And in the interim, what if anything happens in Congress to try and preempt that? Um, I want to just go back real quickly to accountability because I really get stuck on this point. Um, I mean, I I think I I've most frequently work with the Federal Trade Commission, for example, and all we think about is the FTC going to Congress, justifying, explaining what they've done, in the last year, what they want to do in the future, really, uh, the SEC does the same thing, a, 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 almost a request for a, a budget justified by um, all the, the their plans and missions and, and very detailed things. Is there nothing like that for the CFPB? Is there an audit that Congress does? I mean, what are there any sort of checks on what they're doing or how do they, how do they report to Congress on what they're doing? There is some reporting, but they don't have that power of the purse. I mean, you know, in the in the seventies, when the FTC was being criticized as being the national nanny because of the, the kid vid rulemaking and, and other actions, Congress threatened to, to withhold all of its funding until it, it made changes. And that power of the purse, you know, that comes from the quote I, I, I started at the beginning with. Is enormous. I mean, it, it's one thing to, to you know have a little bit of oversight, but when Congress can wipe out your budget, th it creates a much different level of accountability and a much more important check on uh, what powers you have and how you exercise them. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's it's, it's one thing to go before Congress, whether the Senate or um, House, various committees, and get asked tough questions and have to you know withstand that, and then just have your budget just wiped out, it's, those are two different things. Yeah, it creates a set of consequences that the Bureau has never faced before. Um, and of course, obviously it's exercised through the appropriations process, but whether it be the substantive committees that have oversight responsibility for the Bureau or appropriations committees, the staff then and the members have um, much greater ability to influence the outcome of a policy directives at an org agency for which it does appropriate the funds for, both before and after those funds are appropriated, um, including staffing levels. Um, so you haven't seen that at all at the bureau. Um, you know, with with uh, you know, well over 
1,800 staff or so. Um, you know, uh, for those on the webinar, you know, uh, oftentimes we'll regularly send out a copy of the staff directory with the numbers there. Um, that's a long list of staff. Um, and uh, the allocation of where those staff even go can be affected by appropriations. Um, Roy Chopra's travel to Money 2020 earlier this week would have been affected. Um, you name it. Mm -hmm. And I want, but we have a lot to get to. We're going to move on to what impact on the rules and other things the CFPB is doing, past and future cases. But I do want to ask Josh, who um, you know is really um, our key expert here on sort of legislative affairs and, and um, engagement with agencies and things like that. But um, you know, is there talk about this on on the uh, hill, or is there so so, so the the. Some of the relative silence on this coming from the Hill has, has been a bit striking to me. Um, I think some of it is just the timing of it. Um, the fact that we are in this kind of heated election season and, and everybody's distracted, there's, there's that. But I think that there's, there's, there's two sides to this. I think the Democrats right now are careful. I mean, clearly there's been combinations of the decision and you know, there's been statements issued, but Democrats right now are, are, are I think in a spot where to try to sort of sue for peace and suing for peace would be to go to the Republicans and say, we need to run legislation um, that has been introduced by Republican senators and House members for, I don't know, well, past 10 years to put uh, the, C the CFPB into an appropriations process. Um, that, that, would, that would take a, a, a real bipartisan uh, cooperative nature that I, I don't think anyone sees going right now. And I think they would, Democrats see that as very early to, to sort of sort of sue for peace, so to speak. Um, I think they, they, they understand that there's gonna be a number of other circuits that are gonna weigh in on this until it, 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 gets to the, it gets to the Supreme Court. I think the one thing that would change that is if, is if somebody could get a uh, nationwide injunction and then all of a sudden you have a very different Situation, although I think that would probably fast track it up to the up to the Supreme Court. So I, I think right now folks are kind of holding their holding cards close to the vest on, on sort of what what they ultimately would want to do. I think people have to remember as we talk about um, taking this out of the appropriations process and how this was done in the sort of double insulation within the uh, within the the, the Fed. Um, first of all, I think the plaintiffs going up to the court are going to have to answer the very questions that Ellen has posed, which, which is really why is this different? And somebody, I think, on the chat said, why is this different from the Fed structure? Um, or, or Chopra had uh, noted Chopra's statement about if you invalidate this, you invalidate the Fed. I think Chopra's making a very good point. Um, I, I don't think the double insulation argument is going to be sufficient. I think they have to do a fair amount of additional work and briefing um, if they're gonna get this through the Supreme Court um, and to, to demonstrate why if the court, if the Supreme Court were to uh, agree with the Fifth Circuit, it won't undo the entire federal uh, financial regulatory state. Um, how that's done is probably a little bit beyond my, beyond my expertise, but there has been a longstanding push for by Republicans to get this in the commission and get this under appropriations. So the question becomes, okay, if they win this in the Supreme Court and the thing, whole thing is validated, what possible incentive would Republicans have to play ball at this point and appropriate the CFPB? Um, and there are some that think and very rationally think, I mean, you could look at like the Ted Cruz bill uh, that he's introduced over the years, just eliminate it. And, and there will be a call to do that. And, and, and that may be what happens. Um, there's another side of the story which says, you know, it's not the best politics to be eliminating a consumer bureau. And frankly, let's put this thing under Congress and let's control it. And we can sort of dictate how this all works. Um, there's that sort of side to it as well. Um, and, and, and not sort of be the, you know, accused of trying to, uh, to hurt consumers or, or do that. But yeah, I mean, they'll, if they're in the majority in the House and maybe the Senate, why not have Tripper under their under their under their authority, right? The same way uh, they do with the SEC and the CFTC to a to a certain extent. Um, so I, I think that's you know where that all goes. It's it's hard to know, and it really will be if, if this thing goes to Supreme Court. You know, up to really I think up to the what the Republicans will do because the Democrats, of course, would have 
little to no, little to no leverage. But I think going back to Dodd Frank, and I was there for a lot of those discussions, people have to remember how unbelievably intentional this was, this structure. When this came out of the House, it was a five-member commission. Um, it was not funded directly by the Fed. That happened in a later iterations um, as you know, Elizabeth Warren, who's you know, not there as a senator and other advocates said, look, if we don't insulate this thing, if we make a commission, they'll kill us on the quorum. If we put this into you know, like an SEC um, funding uh, proposal, even where the directors are, are, would, be, would be appointed for five years, they'll kill us on approach. So we've got to, I mean, it was a very, very intentional thing to do. Um, and there were plenty at the time that were raising questions about it. And so here we are. And, and Josh, that's, that's fascinating. Thank you. But it also strikes you as, as a little undemocratic, right? It, you know, the, the notion that this enforcement agency isn't accountable to Congress and the you know, single, single uh, chair it, it sort of echoes the, the themes that the, the Fifth Circuit uh, brought out. And, you know, that there is um, an effort and, and concern that the administrative state has grown too big and, and too powerful and its power is unchecked. There's litigation now uh, that the FTC has brought against a, a major national company where that company is challenging the constitutionality of the removal posi positions, provisions, excuse me, of the FTC Act, um, revisiting uh, cases from the, the the Great Depression that, you know, sort of helped set up the administrative state and arguing that the way that agency and other agencies have grown calls to essentially revisit uh, those provisions because the, the separation of powers yeah. really is, isn't being honored. I mean, it, it'll yeah. be very interesting to say, but I mean, this, certainly this is not- in the courts in, in, yeah. in very, you know, long-standing sort of conservative justices, federal society, think pieces that have, that have driven us to where we are today. Um, and it is probably only going in, in one direction. Um, you know, just in terms of like, you know, what's the fix for this? And someone said, can, can't the Congress just, you know, defund the, the CFPB? Well, it's it, because it's not in the appropriations process, it's harder because they have to pass this as an authorization bill, right? You can't just put a rider in an appropriations bill that quick defunds it. I mean, you could if you had bipartisan, um, bipartisan um, agreement, but very likely somebody would challenge that as a point of order and saying, you're legislating on an appropriations bill. Um, because what you really are doing is you're changing the authority by which the, the um, CFPB exists. Now that would have to go to the parliamentarian and maybe they disagree with me on that. But, but that's why this is more complicated than just throwing something into an end of year appropriations bill uh, without like full, almost unanimous consent to do it. Okay. Um, and um, we are at the halfway point um, and then some. So folks, the CLE code is uh, future CFPB 2022. And now um, the small dollar lending rule, um, just to be clear folks, because um, we've talked a little bit about um, all the implications, but to bring it back to the rule, the decision has broad consequences and we're gonna come back to those, but the rule itself is what was invalidated here. Um, and it was done based on the appropriations clause rationale um, that the Bureau has unconstitutional funding authority, therefore could not act and the, uh, the uh, plaintiffs in this situation were harmed as a result of the action that could not have been taken because the funding that was supporting that action was unconstitutional. But um, whether the rule was outside of the Administrative Procedures Act, uh, whether or not the director had been insulated from presidential removal, which was an issue earlier, uh, as well as also uh, the non-delegation doctrine, which is, uh, you know, uh, Congress can't give up what it's supposed to be doing, um, all um, disagreed with on the part of the court um, with respect to the plaintiff's arguments in favor of the Bureau. Um, but, um, you know, even prior to this case, and certainly perhaps unfolding now as we speak, behind the scenes, the Bureau had already been indicating in some of its examinations of small dollar lenders um, that it was gathering information and a bit of saber rattling, again, non-public and confidential, 
that it was looking at the same themes that were in the small dollar lending rule. So you have uh, issues with respect to ability to repay, uh, the number of uh, uh, hits on uh, attempting to um, get a payment from the consumer, from the borrower, uh, and other areas that the Bureau has already been poking around in. So there is the possibility that like the ghost of the payday lending rule could come back. But for all intents and purposes, at least with respect to the actual rule, which the Bureau did seem to concede was new, um, it's, it's been vacated by the court here. Um, and now, of course, the Bureau has some options in terms of where it's going to go. Um, and we've touched on a little bit, but just to put that into some uh, more clarity, um, they can either appeal to the Fifth Circuit um, or they could petition the Supreme Court. And in the meantime, there's a lot going on elsewhere um, that does not involve that particular case or the payday lending rule, but does involve other actions, any one of which could happen uh, first and certainly contemporaneously with whatever the Bureau is going to do with respect to this particular decision in CFSA versus CFPB. Now, Len, there's some, just, yeah. just, course, one of the interesting issues is whether the CFPB is going to seek rehearing on Bonk at the Fifth Circuit. This, this opinion didn't come out of nowhere. In May of this year, in a concurrence, uh, Chief Judge Jones uh, of the Fifth Circuit, joined by several other judges of that court, wrote essentially the precursor to the decision we're talking about today, outlining the exact same arguments. In that case, um, the case was remanded for different reasons, but uh, Judge Jones and her concurrence outlined the, the funding argument uh, to a T. I mean, it's the exact same argument. And, and frankly, that opinion is longer than this one on why uh, the CFPB's funding violates the constitution. And there were four, five judges who joined with her in that, so then you've got the three judges who issued this opinion, and then there were, I think, two other judges who recently joined an opinion at the Fifth Circuit finding that the SEC ALJ provisions, the way they uh, are appointed and supervised, violates the separation of powers clause. So um, typically you would expect the, the agency to seek rehearing en banc, but they may decide that that's futile uh, given the composition of the Fifth Circuit and a large part of the Fifth Circuit's animosity towards the administrative state. So it, it will be curious to see um, whether they, uh, they pursue that route. Yeah, and there's only 16, I believe, 16 active judges in the Fifth yeah. Circuits. You just listed almost almost half, I think. Yeah, I think um, and <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So um, we're, uh, you know, it, yeah, they, the numbers don't look too great there. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, we certainly recognize that not everybody on, on the webinar is a litigator. Uh, Fifth Circuit's, uh, you know, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi. Um, it's not uh, not the rest of the country. Uh, the rest of the country's, um, uh, you know, the other additional circuits. Um, but there's activity in these other circuits. And, you know, the CFPB has an active litigation document. The docket is comprised, um, you know, primarily by companies that have literally had their back uh, put against the wall by the Bureau, um, presumably in most cases after, um, you know, some, some form of investigation or in some cases maybe an examination finding or prior consent order. Um, but in almost every instance, um, you know, organizations that end up in litigation do so um, because uh, not only do they believe the allegations are wrong, but because they can't find any other way to resolve it. Um, and oftentimes the Bureau historically doesn't really give people a very big pathway to resolve it. It's their terms or litigate. Um, so, you know, Len, we've already seen in some jurisdictions, some actions, uh, there's uh, at least four on this slide, we've got three, but then there's also MoneyGram, um, but you've got uh, Progression, TransUnion, and Nationwide Biweekly Administration, that you've got, you know, a smattering of different sort of underlying fact issues there um, but you also have some interesting dynamics as well. Len, I know you've been following this closely. Um, you know, are all of these doom and gloom for the Bureau and victories, uh, you know, in the making for the plaintiffs? Um, you know, there's a recent district court opinion out of Utah that rejected uh, these arguments. Um, there were some earlier decisions involving the CFPB that rejected these arguments. But the, the opinion in the Fifth Circuit, you know, Persuasive, it's, you know, it, it, whether it carries a day, we'll, we'll have to see. But 
every defendant's going to, to, to make these arguments would be malpractice. I think if you didn't at this point, um, and, and the MoneyGram case is, is really fascinating. MoneyGram was in a long investigation with the CFPB. And at the 11th hour, uh, the New York Attorney General came in as well. And then they then sued uh, MoneyGram. And because of the presence of the New York Attorney General, they sued MoneyGram, which is based in Texas, in, in New York. And MoneyGram has moved to have the case uh, transferred to Texas, where the law of the Fifth Circuit would govern. Uh, the Attorney General and the CFPB are fighting that uh, move uh, tenaciously, but it, it, you have to assume that the uh, decision to have the New York Attorney General come in at the last minute in that MoneyGram case was at least partially motivated by the desire to keep the case and have that case filed in New York rather than in, in Texas, because at that point, the uh, All-American ca- check cashing opinion had already come out, um, the concurring opinion that I referenced a few few minutes ago by Judge Jones. And I think lots of people thought that the, the circuit ultimately would go that way. So, you know, I think the CFPB is being resourceful in how they're going to um, fight these things. One of the things that'll be curious to see as well is whether the CFPB starts using its administrative court more. They pass rules to uh, streamline that process and to give the director more control over that process. But since they passed those rules early this year, they have not um, they've not utilized it. They've been filing their actions in federal district courts. That dovetails with uh, a case that is going to get heard this year at the Supreme Court. It's the FTC versus Axon case, A-X-O-N. Axon was in a merger challenge that the FTC was uh, proceeding administratively, and they filed a declaratory judgment action asking to have the manner in which the FTC proceeds administratively declared unconstitutional. It's deprived it of, of due process. And the Supreme Court has now taken up cert on the question of whether you can challenge one of those administrative actions before it's concluded by uh, making constitutional challenges. So any, any uh, administrative proceeding that the CFPB uh, might bring, you would expect that uh, the defendant there might bring a, a constitutional challenge saying this agency is unconstitutional, and you would expect if at all possible, they would bring that into the circuit. Um, And whether you can do that kind of challenge will be decided this year by the Supreme Court. So it's an incredibly dynamic um, area. How the Supreme Court rules on that question may be a bit of a precursor to how it's viewing these type of separation of powers and and due process arguments. So we'll see. But there's a multivariable analysis right now. Well, and there's a lot of possibilities for the types of uh, challenges or, or rationale reasons why somebody might want to challenge the Bureau's authority, um, whether it be CFPB examinations, um, some of the bully pulpit activity from the Bureau where they have um, spoken uh, perhaps louder than they have actually acted, at least to date. Um, although behind the scenes, we're certainly hearing plenty about their positions taking effect through examination findings or um, you know, uh, even in the uh, discussions around investigations resolving with perhaps a consent order, um, you know, it, it, again, as mentioned before, it's their way or the highway. And they've already articulated in at least, um, a, you know, a handful of instances um, publicly, um, whether it be with respect to the use of um, uh, ECOA and, and fair lending principles through UDAP, uh, as well as also any other number of um, concepts where um, the law is um, silent or um, pretty clear that there is not necessarily the um, substantive requirements that the Bureau views are in place. You also have consent orders that are already out there. Um, And those consent orders in some cases may still be in effect. Um, They may have sunset provisions, Um, many do. Um, And certainly in some cases at this point, um, 11 years in, there's any number of consent orders that have come and gone, uh, have been complied with, um, are no longer active, uh, but for which consumer restitution and other um, relief was granted uh, or agreed to uh, by the settling parties. Um, And uh, any number of sort of incidental and unintended consequences as a result of all that with respect to perhaps 
other market participants taking that as um, a view of the CFPB's position through regulation through enforcement. So, Mike, um, you know, you you had been at DOJ um, uh, previous. You've also um, been defending folks against government actions since then. Um, you know, what would your take be on some of this, um, the sort of the past actions? I mean, so the, the these consent orders that are out there that companies are under, um, do they have a claim? Yeah, I mean, I think they, you can make a claim, but I, I think they're not likely to succeed. I, I think courts typically look at settlement agreements um, uh, between private entities and the government um, as, you know, you agree you, you could have pursued uh, your defense if you chose in uh, whatever interests that you thought were best for your, your entity, whether according to the law, the facts, uh, business reasons for whatever purposes you thought a settlement would be best moving forward. So I don't think that courts are likely to unwind that. You know, I kind of liken it to, you know, when I was at DOJ and you prosecute people and sometimes laws change, um, sometimes sentencing guidelines change. Um, if, you know, someone was convicted and sentenced pursuant to um, a law, uh, the, maybe the elements of which have changed, they don't typically go back and um, let those individuals, uh, you know, have, have a, a retrial uh, or anything like that. Um, you know, I think I think the more interesting question is where do you go, you know, from here? Where, what happens going forward? If you were an entity and you get a CID, um, you know, I think the, the wise move is either not to respond to it and let the um, CFPB move to compel production um, or, you um, you know, in which case you can challenge it under the Fifth Circuit um, ruling, or you can file a declaratory judgment action in advance. Uh, I think, you know, there's going to be some forum shopping there. Obviously, the CFPB is going to move to compel. They're going to file it in a, in a district that is more favorable to them. Um, and if you file a DJ action, you know, maybe you could pick a, a more favorable forum. Again, all of this, it really kind of depends on the entity, the business, uh, its risk appetite, uh, how much it's willing to the challenge and actually fight this. Some might think it's just in their best interest to, you know, we got nothing to hide here. Let's just, you know, produce what we got to produce and get away with this or get, or get through with this um, rather. Um, but, you know, I'm sure there are plenty more who are interested in fighting. Um, one thing I remember, I think you addressed this, but after we saw the, the FTC AMG decision come out, we had a lot of uh, recent FTC defendants rushing to say, hey, can we do something about this? Can we go get our, our settlement invalidated? And uh, I don't know if we'll see that here for all the reasons that, that Mike and Lund just covered, but I think certainly anything on the table right now is going to have a different strategy. The other um, thing I've seen, I mean, we've seen any number of CFPB uh, litigation involving the CFPB where we've seen lots of arguments that have challenged the constitutionality of the CFPB. And I think a lot of those are, are mostly on its structure with the one director versus five. But um, why this case? Like, what was it just a better, better arguments, a different way of looking at things? But what's the difference between these and the other, um, so many other challenges that have just sort of been deflected pretty routinely by courts? I think the composition of the Fifth Circuit makes a huge difference here. All three of the judges who issued this opinion are Trump appointees. As Josh was mentioning earlier, there has been a concerted effort by the Federalist Society to challenge what they perceive as the overreach of the administrative state. And the CFPB is probably the poster child in their view for that kind of overreach because of its vast power and its unaccountability. Um, so I, I, I think that, you know, elections matter and uh, it matters a lot with judicial appointments. And I think that that is certainly um, one thing that has changed from some of those those earlier decisions. I also think uh, some of the action, actions uh, of the CFPB in the last year or two, I mean, judges aren't immune to what's going on. They read the Wall Street Journal. And they, they see sort of how aggressive uh, Chopra has been. And I, I have to think that that colors uh, their, their views and, and their concerns about uh, the, the creep of the administrative state. Um, we had a. Also I know we, two, we were. Ellen, okay, it, it, takes, it takes two to tango, um, and uh, you know there is any number of situations where companies have really been pushed by the bureau 
um, the regulation through enforcement um, fosters uh, situations where people want to contest the validity of the Bureau. They have no choice. Um, the Bureau has taken positions that are not found in law or regulation in some instances um, that have been aggressive um, and existential threats to the activities of the organizations that they've been focused on. And so as a result of that, you may even have a higher propensity uh, of organizations seeking to challenge the Bureau than you would otherwise, simply because of the Bureau's own actions. Now, of course, um, the Bureau is doing that um, consciously and intentionally, but it is, um, it's notable. And then this current climate in the last year, um, it, it, that has not stopped at all. And now that we're about uh, you know, a year and a month or so into the Chopra administration at the Bureau, we're going to start to see the, uh, or we're going to start to see the fruits of his specific actions. A, a lot of what was announced on, in the last several months had its roots in investigations or exams that started earlier. Uh, certainly the policy pronouncements have gotten attention, but um, one would think one would start to see the investigations also get in, uh, uh, attention as well. Um, but I think it's important uh, to also note that they do so much through the supervision authority um, that never actually does get litigated, at least up until now. And uh, that very well could change as well. Now, Len, you were a former enforcement. Um, if you were at the Bureau running their enforcement shop, and my question for you, would this change how you'd approach it at all? Or would you still just go, uh, you know, guns ablaze, which is what, certainly what Chopra has said and what their attorneys have been indicating? I, I think you have to go guns ablaze. Otherwise, um, you, you sort of can't be a little, little bit pregnant on something like this. I think you've got to take the position that you know, the agency is constitutionally funded. You know, you did something wrong and you can either settle or we're going to sue you. Um, oh, they're not, they're not going to change. They're not changing they anything. Change. No, they're <laughs> They're, they're, in fact, you know, they're, they might be more, more aggressive now just to show that they, you know, they can, they're not counted by this and they're not going to stop. They might be more thoughtful as to, you know, again, where they, where they file um, that kind of strategy type work, but you're not going to see them slow down. Yep. Do you think that there's um, any, and putting that aside, underlying concern, or do you think um, this one of our panel or one of our uh, participants asked this question or something similar to it, but um, on the payday lending rule itself, are we going to see the FTC now try to step in? They've they've done payday lending type of work. I mean, is there the FTC's in rulemaking frenzy? I mean, is anybody eager to pick this up and and or is it just you know we're gonna anything like that that we might see? Oh, well, I think you will see enforcement for potentially if the CFPB starts to run into more problems with its its funding structure and you know other courts adopt this argument. You know, I think you might see a coordinated effort by the Bureau to try and farm out some of its work to either the FTC or the states on the enforcement side. The, the rulemaking side is, I think, is, is more challenging. I'm not, some of these rules are uh, exclusively within the uh, jurisdiction uh, of the CFPB, but I think on the enforcement side, you would see, I think, an effort to push some of these uh, enforcement actions down to the states and, and perhaps some to the FTC. Yeah, and the FTC's rulemaking authority is, is much narrower than the CFPB's and in some cases could take, um, you know, take I'd literally take a decade, um, yeah. given some of the lack of um, ability to use the Administrative Procedures Act and notice of comment rulemaking. And so, um, so substantively, you could see this no different than the Bureau, the ghost of the rule and some of the concepts in the rule, uh, particularly through UDAP or UDAP with two A's. I might, I, might, I might just, I'm sorry, John, I might just add to that point that the, the enforcement director of the CFPB, you know, I know him well, we worked together at DOJ, he was a civil rights attorney there while I was there, um, and, you know, Eric uh, has strong ties throughout government, so if, if your, your question is, are they going to start farming maybe some things out to FTC, I don't know, maybe, maybe not, but he does have strong ties throughout government, and there is a level of coordination um, that perhaps, um, you know, uh, the CFPB hasn't or might not have had in years past. Uh, I think you'll probably see that going forward. And certainly the Bureau has made, uh, been shouting from the rooftops that uh, states have authority to enforce the CFPA. Um, they've been chiding other government regulators to step it up. 
Um, you know, this is, um, you know, it's, this is not all happening in a vacuum. It's, it's certainly, um, uh, you know, collectively um, thought through. Um, and, you know, obviously time will tell. Now, coming up in just um, a little bit more than a week and a half, you've got the election. So, um, you know, as, as Josh said earlier, there can be, um, there, there can be potentially uh, Congress weighing in on this. And at some point, perhaps Congress has to weigh in on this. Um, but that dynamic and um, whether or not Democrats would acquiesce, whether or not uh, Democrats control uh, House and Senate and the, uh, the committees that have oversight over the CFPB um, is you know, up for grabs, um, as well as also uh, certainly just even the, the political balance with respect to any potential, um, I hesitate to say the word compromise, um, but ultimately whatever is worked out if Congress decides to step in. And I think the real question in my view actually is not whether or not Congress will step in, but kind of the timing, um, what will force them to step in. Um, and at least so far, it's that they've been very reluctant to step in on anything with respect to the Bureau over the last decade. So it seems like that's probably gonna to continue to be the case. Okay. That will depend uh, on how flexible Elizabeth Warren and her team are on effects. I mean, I think, you know, if, if she's willing to have it be subject to the appropriations process and perhaps a five person commission, it may be able to get fixed more quickly than, um, uh, otherwise, you know, it, it's going to be, it's going to be a challenge. Well, with that, um, you know, any, any last thoughts, Mike? Just buckle up. I mean, I, I think this is this is going to be going to be a wild ride. I think for um, for the, the you know foreseeable future. But again, I think everybody should be prepared for continue to be prepared for an aggressive CFPB going forward, and probably aggressive defense too. Right, Len? I think that's right. I think they will aggressively defend their position, and I think they'll be as aggressive, if not more so. I mean, in litigating against the CFPB. At times, I found they don't take a very good view of the other side's position. They, they sort of look at things through, through their lens and, and don't see the other side of things. And I have to think this is going to make that even worse. And Ellen, do, do you have a, a magic eight ball that you can um, de determine when, um, when, when this will resolve itself? If I did, I'd go back to Vegas, Jonathan. So <laughs> I do not. But... Um, but we're out of time, so maybe one more time for the CFPB code, um, or not? When is the code code? Is, yeah, <laughs> CFPB future twenty twenty two. John, um, Jonathan, and, just to be clear, it, I, I'm not. Is the code twenty twenty two or just twenty two? It, it's 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 twenty twenty two. So, um, folks, thank thank you very much for attending today. This is what we do. We love uh, discussing topics, uh, both generically as well as also um, one on one. Um, uh, on behalf of Len, Mike, Ellen, and Josh, um, and our events team, we thank you for joining us today on the future of the CFPB. Um, for those of you that have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out. And we uh, appreciate your attendance today, and thank you for your time.